Okay. My name's David Brown. I'm on the Board of Youth Services. Youth Services is a countywide organization serving youth, families, and uh, young adults within the community. And um, it's been historically with children, but now doing more and more with adults with restorative justice as well. This is fun tonight. That It's something a little different. It, it brought in a, a group of uh, community folks that are dancers, and it seems to be a fun night. We're very appreciative of all the donors. Uh, people who came this evening and who who sponsored us and others who are participating. It's, it's a great time and uh, I hope that if people weren't able to make it this year that they'll be able to make it next year. It's time for Talkin' Nerdy, the nerdy talk show where I ask my guests to talk nerdy to me. Oh my... You are listening to Talking Nerdy, the nerdy talk show where I ask my lovely, lovely guests to uh, talk nerdy to me. But, you know, in a family-friendly way, because this is a family-friendly show. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Right? This is always family-friendly. Yes. Yes. See, you learned. Last time you said no, and I said no, and yeah. then you said yes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know what I called this episode today, you two? What? Yes. I called it Still Alive in the Basement. You know, still alive. And now everybody in the audience who's heard that song has it stuck in their heads. You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for tuning in so much. If you're listening on WLMC Landmark College Radio out of Putney, Vermont, thank you so much. If you're watching on the Frost Raven YouTube channel, again, thank you so much for listening in to us, talking nerdy in a basement. And if you're watching on BCTV, hello from the past. Nice to see you. Nina Gershi, she's going to be our first person. So when you finish, don't go anywhere, because i got to talk to the judges when you finish. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you sure? Totally. Do you need me to you need me, you practice first? <laughs> no, you, you got it. Yeah. Okay, thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is how it's gonna go. Flynn's gonna whisper in my ear, and then I'm gonna say it to you. Oh. <laughs> uh, flute player, Vincent Broderick, was a, it was a flute player from Sligo, which is on the west coast of Ireland. That's gonna droop, but. All right. Yeah. For me, I might be starting to get really angry at people in my family that I didn't, that for no reason. I mean, I was just, um, I was um, sitting around crying a lot, um, not being willing to call people up that I usually could easily call up, um, not being able to figure things out, forgetting lots of stuff, forgetting appointments. Um, uh -huh. Not being able to remember things. Yeah, that's right. And you know, just walking around, what don't know what to do. Yes. And also, you know, then when I think of future, 
nothing bright is coming. Nothing bright is coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's really a bad sign. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thinking, thinking about plans to do away with myself. Yep. Uh huh. Thinking uh, about plans to do away with yourself. Or um, praying for the demise of others. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, really wishing harm on other people. That's wishing a sign harm. of. Yeah. yeah, things are breaking down. Yeah. You don't want to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sometimes I might find myself withdrawing from social contact. Yep. Um, don't want to talk to anybody. Right. Or another thing, I might get a notice that something is going to be shut off because I haven't paid the bill. So you haven't paid your bills and you're, yeah. Right. And now some people I'm fairly familiar with. The Franklin Farms, David and Mary Ellen Franklin. They are holding the banner. They milk 65 cows in Guilford and sell eggs, beef, and syrup they produce at their farm store on the Weatherhead Hollow Road. They have amethyst, star, chocolate, fritter, sun, and eagle, the Franklin Farm. (laughs) With their lightsabers. I I hope uh, everyone at home is is seeing just how beautiful these heifers are because up close and personal, they have some of the most beautiful coats and they are dressed. Oh, here's some more pretty ones from the Merrimack County 4-H Dairy Club. And that dairy club is made up of 10 families. Not all of the families own and operate working dairy farms. However, they all share a passion for cows. When I travel around and give talks, I always ask, how many of your parents apologized to you when you were coming up? Room of 100 people, 200 people. At the most, 10% of people raised their hands. We have astonishing little, little practice with apology and asking for forgiveness and repair when there has been a rupture. So after you come back down again and you want to start again, you can say, I'm really sorry for what I did that made this escalate the way it did. I'd love to have a better conversation with you. Can we try again? Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes adolescents apologize too and they go, yeah, I'm sorry also. Uh, you know, that got out of hand. And they're, you know, it's a practice. Well, it's such important modeling. Right. It's, uh, that it's, it's, it's such important modeling in terms of, um, I can, uh, you know, it's okay to be wrong, it's okay to be human, it's okay to be imperfect. And take responsibility for what you have responsibility for, because it's a two-person escalation usually. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Again, we are the Tufts Beelzebub's, Tufts' <laughs> oldest male a cappella group, and we are so, so honored to be here for our 11th time, I suppose. Um, it's really, really an honor to be here. This is absolutely my favorite gig of the year. And if you like what you've heard so far, we will be selling merch outside after the show. And we're all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, you name it. Our handle is at Tufts Bubs. Um, thank you so much, and we have one more for you. Crash and burn, asking who you to look away. Crash and burn, wondering why it is that you say, No, it is pretty hard to handle anything. But you never give up on me.
Master has given Dobby a diploma. Dobby is a free elf. <laughs> Although, in all seriousness, I'd like to thank my parents and my siblings and the wonderful Lizzie Hubbard. Thank you very much. I wouldn't have made it back. Jamal Jackson. I just want to say I did this. God bless you. Uh, first, I want to thank my mom, my aunt, my dad for coming up here. It's a long drive from uh, Maryland to uh, Vermont. Thank you, mom, for being my mom and my dad at some points. Large-scale standardized assessment that is sort of statewide. Uh, we think of large-scale assessment as those statewide or national assessments that's given to a large group of students. Primary purpose is to uh, provide feedback on how groups of students are doing. Um, we can use individual student level results, but really the, the main focus is on how groups of students are doing it. That's most of what I'll show you here. So if we look at, I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to, all right, if you look that way and you look that way, we'll get all, everybody covered. Okay, so first slide is just the English language arts results for all of the schools. So we're down, next slide. Yeah. All of the schools in Wyndham Southeast plus state averages for third through eighth grade and then also state average at, the, at ninth grade. You'll see that uh, for English language arts generally, uh, Dummerston is scoring at 71% of students proficient. The state average for grades three through eight is 61% of students proficient. And you can see how the other schools are scoring. The reason that I care so deeply about this school, the reason that I was so excited to be a part of the founding of Landmark College was that I am dyslexic. And I'm also a lot older than most of you students, so I was dyslexic before folks really knew what dyslexia was. So I've told this story many times, but when I got to second grade, and I know you've all, you're all familiar with being called in the principal's office, right? Raise your hand here if you were never in the principal's office. Uh, exactly. We are in the same club. So one day around second grade, I got called into the principal's office, and I couldn't figure out why, because frankly, I hadn't done anything yet to warrant my being called into the principal's office that day. And I get there, and this is how we did it back in the 60s in Vermont. Uh, but they had my mom and dad sitting in the chairs, and no one will understand this better than landmark students. And they sat me down. This was the psychology of how to build confidence in a young dyslexic kid in those days. And the principal turned to my parents and said, listen, uh, we don't know what's wrong with Peter. Uh, we cannot teach him how to read. I, I actually um, went on your on your website, uh, ChristineForVermont.com, and um, it was, it was, which is a very good website. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I read that in in 2015, while your son was filming a documentary about you, you made a decision to publicly come out as a transgender woman, uh, the first business leader uh, in the country to transition while while in office. How has this experience prepared you for to be the CEO of Vermont? Well, it's, I would say, the, the, the one, what we look, I like to talk about the, the governors being the chief executive of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Leadership is the key, one of the key things people need to be looking for. Um, and courageous leadership and honesty is probably very mm -hmm. important. Honesty is very important with that too. I will tell you, when I decided to transition, it was for my children. I had three wonderful children. I raised three wonderful Vermonters. We had, the, we had a wonderful relationship, mm -hmm. but they didn't know the most important truth about me, and I was gonna take that to my grave. I was sure I was gonna lose my job, and I was sure I was gonna lose everything, but the truth was more important. So I transitioned on December 2nd, 2015, and a miracle happened. Vermont welcomed me with open arms. Townsend flip-flops it. Uh, one year we do the town, the school district first, 
and then and the next year we do the town first and we do that because some people just come for the school or the town and so to give them the nine o'clock or one so we flip-flop the meetings next year the town meeting will be first and then we'll do the school at one and then the following year we'll flip it back that's the answer yes if there were to be a change to another day for town meeting or australian ballot would... well it'd have to be they would have to be at another warn meeting to change the date we'd have to have another meeting to change because we've set the date at this town meeting any other discussion okay a yes vote will pass the date and time of the annual meeting of the town and school district for the first tuesday of march in the year 2019 at one o'clock a no vote will defeat that all those in favor please say aye, aye. Next question. The opioid crisis affects too many families in our town, and the stigma that's associated with it complicates recovery. How do you think the town can best tackle that stigma and support recovery? We'll start with Shanta. Of course. Um, I think that, again, it comes back to recognizing that these issues are impacting us on a very personal level. Uh, it may be a friend that we know, maybe a family member, uh, it may be someone that we saw serving us breakfast at a local restaurant, which actually is my story from one of the deaths that um, happened over the past few years here. And I think that it, one, it involves, again, a shift in terms of how we think about who is all involved and who is all impacted.